maybe we'll just start off with with Nova Ming and um, what brought you here? What was the journey? What led you to write this novel? Well, um, I had written two books of short stories. So Islands of Decolonial Love was my first kind of creative work. And then um, The Sextant of Being Lost was my next endeavor. And a lot of people had advised me that the novel is the thing to write, something in longer form. Um, so this was my foray into a longer form. And it was very um, hard actually for me to get my head around the genre of the novel because my background is in Anishinaabe storytelling practices and Anishinaabe intellectual traditions. And of course, traditionally we don't have novels or, or stories that are that long. Um, and so the novel and the structure of the novel and the protagonist and the antagonist and the conflict and all of those parts of a novel are not so present in Anishinaabe storytelling. So I still wanted to, to tell a story in longer form. Some of the characters that I had um, come up with in Islands of Decolonial Love appear again and, and um, this accident of being lost and then appear again in Nopaming because I just, I fell in love with these characters and I, I carried them with me in my life and I, I, th <laughs> I thought about them and had conversations with them. And so they're very present in the novel. And um, it, it ends up being a, a very, very different kind of novel, obviously, and a very, very different reading experience, which, which was deliberate on, on my part, for sure. Uh, yeah, so it's like, and it's terrific. Like it's, it is a different experience for a lot of us who are used to the traditional Western structure, the, the circularness of it, the, the weaving in and out, the white space. Um, everybody I've talked to who's read it has had a different experience with it. Um, did you, ha can you speak a bit about that? Um, well, you know what, I'll, I'll say that I was kept going back kind of to the beginning and looking at the back cover because the characters move from from people to elements to organs to, to all the, it's very obvious the interconnectedness of all things. And I would love to hear your thoughts on that. So within Anishinaabe thought, relationality is, is really, really important. And it's how the world is organized for us rather than a hierarchy. Um, so relationships with living things, with other humans, with our family, with the plant and animal world, um, with the natural world are very, very important and they're very intimate and they're very local, um, but they're also very global because of that interconnection. So I thought about a lot about networks in this, in this book and um, horizontal networks and how to maintain healthy relationships and healthy intimate relationships um, as an individual, as someone who's a member of a family, as someone who's a member of a community and, and someone who's a human on, on the planet. And so I wanted that relationality to be really clear in the book. I, wanted um, that circular idea of time and space um, that's also a part of Anishinaabe thought rather than having a, a very clear uh, linear past, present and future, um, we tend to think of things in circles and in, and in cycles. And so I wanted to have a book where you could essentially start anywhere in the book and read it and, and still have some semblance of the story um, again, in Anishinaabe thought, everything that's alive has spirit. And so plants, trees, things like maple trees have a spirit. Um, caribou has a spirit. And so these characters, the seven main characters in the book, some are human, some are non-human, but they're all together sort of in, in the present sharing this time and this space. 
um, between sort of Peterborough, Nagojiwani, where I live, and, and Toronto, they're finding those interstitial spaces uh, in parks and on the side of the lake and in provincial parks um, to be Anishinaabe. And so this book is very much about the present, and it's very much about building Anishinaabe worlds in the present with whatever, with whatever we have, because I see that practice as being something that has been a really beautiful form of resistance that so many um, Anishinaabe families have engaged in and so many women in my family have engaged in this building of Anishinaabe world so that I could grow up and have some of these pieces. Um, and the, the white space in the book is very much a reflection of sort of a contemporary indigenous experience um, in under colonialism where you have these pieces of yourself and these pieces of your culture and pieces of language and you're sort of always trying to to put them together so it's a very fragmented existence and in terms of identity and language and culture um, and that stitching together stitching up the holes um, stitching things together is is part of, of I think um, the reality of contemporary indigenous life, and I also just wanted to have some space in the book for the reader to just take a breath and to think and to allow some of the the language just to sink in. Um, that's another thing that I think culturally our elders don't um, fill empty spaces with with chit chat they they are more maybe reserved in that way and and there's silence and silence is a good thing silence is okay silence doesn't doesn't mean anything and so I wanted to have that that sort of space in the book as well yeah I love that you know it's um well, I, it worked for me. <laughs> As I was reading it, I have windows in my apartment. And so I see a lot of sky. I'm very fortunate to have that. So there's, and uh, over this past year, I've been spending, you know, basically 100% of the time here. That's right. Um, and uh, it helped me do that. It felt very grounding and like a real slowing down of, um, you know, different from other books that I've read. Mm -hmm. um, the idea, you said the present, and you've talked about this idea too of light, bidiban, am I saying that right? Bidabin. Bidabin. Bidabin, yeah. The future collapsing into the past, which is the present. And is that sort of um, a call to make us, I mean, like living in the moment, if you will, or is that is that it, or is it deeper? A lot of this book and a lot of, well, all of my books are, because I'm a parent, <laughs> they're written very early in the morning when people are still asleep in my house. And so this book, my kids are now getting older, and so they sleep longer and longer. And so the dawn is something that was present for me when I was writing this book. I would watch, you know, sit by the window and watch the changing light and watch the sun come up every day. The Anishinaabe word for dawn is bidabin and it's um, bidabin, it's actually an Anishinaabe name. You'll hear, you'll hear people who are named bidabin. Um, but if you split that word into its, its three smaller words, the be is a, um, prefix that means the future is coming at you. The da is means home or the present and ba or ban is a suffix that we would put on the end of someone's name who had passed into the spirit world. So it's indicative of the past. So every morning I'm getting up and I'm watching the sunrise and that's a very important thing. That's something that my ancestors would have done. That was a, a ceremony. They would have started their morning before dawn, um, putting tobacco in the fire, praying and watching this, what I've come to really appreciate as, as sort of the spectacular moment of, 
hope, especially in the pandemic, that first, those first rays of light that are coming over the horizon. Um, and, and calling it Badabin, to me, sort of is like a conversation with those that have come before me, my ancestors, my grandparents, my great grandparents, and also those, those, those ones that are gonna come after me. So it really puts an emphasis on how important it is in terms of our own lives and in terms of our own responsibilities for how, how we're living, because how we're living will give birth to the world that our, our grandchildren and great-grandchildren inherit. And so that just became a really interesting concept to work with in this, in this book, um, particularly because Indigenous people are so often um, kind of put in a box of, of being in the past. And a lot of Indigenous writers right now are really focused on the future and Indigenous futurism and, and all of the kinds of wonderful visioning and imagining. And I think that's a really great thing for them to be doing. But for me, um, I really think of the present as being important. And I wanted to sort of illuminate um, the worlds that Anishinaabe people were building in Toronto, in Peterborough, in Canada, that were not visible um, to people outside of our, of our culture. Um, because these worlds are, are, exist and they're, they're beautiful and they're a beautiful part of my life. And, uh, and it's, it's those sort of other worlds that are existing alongside um, colonial worlds that I wanted, to, I wanted to spend hours a day thinking about and living in through, this, through writing this book. Do you have a favorite? was spending time with these characters. I don't know if you play favorites, but. I loved writing this book and I, I love Nanatek, the maple tree. I love the older characters now. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's because I'm getting older, but I just love the freedom uh, that uh, Minda Moya has in terms of doing whatever it is she needs to do in this unapologetic way. And if that means walking into, a, uh, into an Ikea and, and doing strange things, then, then she's gonna do that. Um, yeah, so I really, liked, I really liked those older characters in the book, for sure. And it's there's some there's humor plays a role in your in your work. Um, is that I don't, sometimes it's really difficult. writers find it difficult to do humor, but it seems to just flow naturally. Or can you talk about that? I think culturally, there's a lot of humor in Anishinaabe culture. There's a lot of laughing in my family. There's a lot of uh, like as a coping mechanism, as a way of healing, as a as a way of just bringing joy into life. And so I wanted the, that to be reflective in the the novel. And it, I, it did flow very. I didn't find that part of of writing the novel difficult. That was something that just flowed pretty naturally for me. Yeah. Um, and the, the sub, I guess it's a subtitle or subheader, the, the cure for white ladies, where this is a, a group of white ladies on the call. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for coming anyway. <laughs> um, it was a reference to Susanna Moody's work and Catherine Patrell's work, who were two very important canonical uh, white women writers in, in Can Lit um, who are writing in, in Michisagik and Islamic territory in the mid 1800s to the late 1800s. And um, that in itself is, is a feat and it's celebrated and I think it should be celebrated. And as an Anishinaabe person, um, their work is very difficult to read for me um, because the depictions of Mississauga and Anishinaabe people are very, very racist. Um, 
there's parts of, of, of roughing it in the bush that's very anti-Black and the consequences of not just those sort of racial slurs, but the consequences of the actions of those time um, were extremely violent for my family and for, for my ancestors. And so I think that I carry and my children carry the trauma and some of the damage from that. And so I wanted to, I mean, Margaret Atwood and Carol Shields have written books about that are sort of riffing off of um, the work of, of Susanna Moody and, and her sister. And I wanted to do something different. I wanted to use the book as a jumping off point. So the word nopaming in my language means in the bush. So whereas for these, these women from England, the bush was kind of a nightmare of, <laughs> of work and uh, very opposite to, to the life that they were, they were used to. Uh, for me and for, for my people, it's the most beautiful, loving, soulless place. It's, it mean, everything is in the bush. Everything that has meaning for us is in the bush. Um, and I wanted to show sort of the worlds, these Anishinaabe worlds that those two writers couldn't see because of their, their racism and because of their, their beliefs. So I wanted to kind of hint towards um, had they come into my territory with a different mindset, uh, the possibilities of what could have happened. Um, so there's, so it's sort of tongue in cheek and it's sort of a, a humorous way of, of looking at it. And the focus is not really at all on, on them. Um, the focus is on these gorgeous, generative, beautiful worlds that they missed. In terms of art making change in a political um, way uh, or policy change, this is this group too is a bunch of status quo challengers and feminist entrepreneurs and change makers. Um, well, how do you see the role of art? I think it was highlighted at the US inauguration with uh, Amanda Gorman and that amazing poem, right? It just yeah. kind of, people stop to listen and watch and be changed because a lot of the commentary is that art can say things that you can't say, politicians can't say, or, you know, members of parliament. What do you think about that? I think for me, it's another tool. So um, I'm also an academic, so I teach this kind of stuff in the, in the indigenous politics in the classroom. That's one tool um, when you have a captive audience um, whose marks and future are dependent on your grading. Um, that's a certain dynamic. Uh, writing is another dynamic um, where people can engage, you know, without you being present at their own, on their own pace. Um, and then I think performance is another way of um, taking sort of my practice into theaters and, and bars and interacting with people face to face through music and through performance. Um, that's a different, a different tool. And I think all of those tools can be transformative and all of them cannot be transformative as well. So I think it's, it's um, their, their tools and I, speaking to different audiences through different tools is, is um, something that's, that's important. I also think groups like this and change makers and people who are challenging policy and who are out on the streets, um, activists, I think this group of people who sees the world a little differently also needs to find, needs to be able to find art where they can find affirmation and comfort and stress relief. And um, I think that's very important for me in terms of connecting to indigenous audiences is um, not necessarily writing for them, but writing to them um, so that um, they can, I, I mean, I, they can like read 
and find some humor in, in opening and find some comfort in opening and find some reflection of, of the people that are in their lives in opening. I think that's something that's been really important to me because it's not something that I had um, growing up. What, uh, what kind of uh, response have you been getting? I mean, just, I guess a general question, but it's strange to make art and release art in the pandemic um, because it sort of feels like you didn't make art or <laughs> release art um, in some ways. It's, it's very, it's been a very strange experience. I am um, early on in the pandemic, my sister Ansley Simpson, who is a singer songwriter in Toronto and I um, recorded a, a short four track EP called the Nopaming Sessions where I do four readings over original music that she composed. So you can find that on Bandcamp as a way of helping the novel travel through the internet um, just because there, there's been no in-person book launches or, or writers festivals this year. Um, we also then collaborated with a Taiwanese Canadian new media artist in East Vancouver, Sammy Chian, who made a gorgeous video um, piece for the first, the beginning of the novel called Solidification. So you can find that on YouTube. Um, and then I did a bunch of writers festivals, which were, which ended up being really great because um, a bunch of people came through Zoom platforms that maybe wouldn't normally have come to a Writers' Festival. Um, so that was nice, but it's, it's, been, it's been really kind of still isolating in, in a strange time to, to launch a book. And I knew, I mean, my, my people told me that this book was because of its form and because of its content probably uh, was going to be a, a challenge for for people and i think that i've i've received some really really beautiful comments and some beautiful feedback so i know that it wasn't um it wasn't said i didn't set out to write a commercially successful novel um, i set out to do something that was incredibly meaningful and important to me um, in form and content and i think that in that way it's been successful